is a tent. The tabernacle is the only thing that was fashioned after what God had in heaven. Matter of fact, if you go to Revelations, it says the Lord pitched in in heaven. You don't pitch a temple. You pitch you pitch a tent. So Moses had the real direct replica per se, even though as we move along into Solomon and those things, uh, Solomon's temple was much grander and much more beautiful. But as we went through the lesson you've seen, it was not according to what God wanted. I find today in much Christianity, and I'm not against lights, and I'm not against smoke machines. I, I'm not against a lot of things. I don't think those things are sin. But we cannot ever be guilty of trying to replace the anointing with the show. I'm not against the show. I'm, I'm, you want to go see a show, go. I have heard they had great shows in Branson with Noah and Moses. And I'm not against shows. If you're against shows, that's fine. Don't go see them. I'm not against shows per se. I'm, I'm not, I mean, I'm, I'm against fleshly things that provoke lust and those kind of things, but I'm not against shows per se. But the church was never designed to be a show. I believe in lively, good worship. But it's not so that we are the show. It's because He is the show, and we're just responding to His greatness. Amen? But as you, as you, I hope I'm making some sense. As you go from the tabernacle, tabernacle was drab and ugly on the outside. It bad your skin. Looking from a distance, there's nothing there that you'd want to go see. All right? There's a reason when they bring a circus into town, they put lights everywhere and they make everything pretty. They want to attract you. All right? But the tabernacle wasn't like that. It was only beautiful on the inside. If you didn't get to go inside, you didn't know how pretty it was. The church is a lot like that. From the outside, it's ugly. It's drab. It's plain. God designed it like that because he only wants those who come in to see his glory. But when you get to Solomon's temple, and that's the first temple. I want you to understand that the first temple is Solomon's temple. All right, the tabernacle's first, but the first temple is Solomon's temple, the permanent structure. It's, it's magnificent. Totally built wrong. Not a whole lot like the tabernacle as it should have been. There was no reason in the world for Solomon to change anything from what God gave Moses. But he did it, I think, because he wanted something that would be majestic to the human eye. And I think what a lot of Christianity is getting caught up in today is this thing of wanting to be appealing to people. The only way someone can be converted, everybody say converted. converted. All right? The, a conversion and a crowd are always not the same thing. You can get a crowd and have a big mess. But a conversion is different. And the only way someone could be converted is to come into the presence of God, and only God can draw them in. But Solomon tried with the beautiful exterior, and it was glorious. It was magnificent, the temple of Solomon. And, of course, it was run over by the Babylonians and crushed. And, and you, I went through the lesson about how God did this because they just wouldn't listen to the prophets, the preachers, over and over and over. And finally, God just crushed the whole thing, and God left, the next lesson in Ezekiel, God left that temple before the Babylonians came and tore it apart. So it wasn't as if God got defeated by anybody. God had already left. Understand, when something happened in this world and people say, where was God? Well, look back. You may have asked him to leave, and he may have already left. When you kick God out of schools and then you want to blame God when bad stuff happens in schools, you're going to have to make up your mind. Do you want God in schools or do you want him out of schools? Because he'll oblige you either way. But don't get mad at God if you kick him out. Because it's on you then. Well, that was free. The second temple, we're coming back now. We've, we've lost the first temple to the Babylonians. 
and they go into exile, and tonight they're going to come back to the promised land. And, of course, you know that Jeremiah prophesied that it would be 70 years, and Daniel saw this in 70 years. I'm going to bring them back, and they're going to build the second temple. Now, tonight we are looking for, in the book of Revelations, the third temple that the Antichrist will stand in and declare that he is God. So we're looking for this to happen. All right, so let's go now to Haggai chapter 2. Next slide. <clears throat> Haggai 2, beginning in verse 1. I'll be reading down to wherever Haggai stops. This is the second temple. Haggai chapter 2, verse 1. Now, in your Bible, there are three books that you can read about the return of the Israelites to, uh, the, to Judah. Uh, Ezra, Nehemiah, and Haggai are all three post-exile books. What I mean is these are all the books about them coming back from Babylon. And I've had a lot of people just start reading the Bible, and they start in the beginning on just go straight through it. And I say, that may not be your best. That be. You may want to go find you a, a, something that kind of gives you an outline of what's going on. Because, man, if you just start reading, I mean, if you just read Revelations from front to back and think it's all in chronological order, you've got about nine raptures. There ain't but one rapture. It's just talked about several different times. you got to kind of understand the layout. So when you look, read about this second temple, you've got several books to, to look at. But we'll look at a couple of them tonight. Haggai 2 and verse 1. Then on, Now this is the New Living Translation. puts it into our language. Then on October 17th of that same year, the Lord sent another message to the prophet Haggai. He's a prophet saying this to Zerubbabel, the son of whoever that is, governor of Judah. Zerubbabel is the governor, Haggai is the prophet, and to Jeshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and to the remnant of God's people there in the land. These are the people who have come back. All right, keep going for me. Does anyone remember this house, this temple? He's talking about Solomon's temple, the glorious, magnificent temple that Solomon built. In its former splendor, this is God speaking, how in comparison does it look to you now? Now, they built this second temple, and God is saying, it must seem like nothing at all. And it did. Compared to what Solomon had, what these remnant of people with very little supplies were managed to throw together was nothing compared to what Solomon did. All right, go ahead. Verse 4, but now the Lord says, be strong, Zerubbabel, be strong, Jeshua, uh, son of Zehozadak, the high priest, be strong, all of you, sit still left in the land, and now get to work, for I am with you, says the Lord of heaven's armies. Keep going. My spirit remains among you, just as I promised when you came out of Egypt, so do not be afraid. Now, you've got to understand the reason they're afraid is because they had enemies on all sides. All right, I'm, I'm going to get a little bit ahead give you a little bit of extra. All right, when they came back, there was a remnant. There was no walls, probably was no houses, there was no temple. They walked up there, and there wasn't nothing but rubble. Welcome home. Get to work. Most of the things God's going to do in your life is going to require some work from you. And, 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 and they come and they're going to start. And, and the first thing they build, I got a whole lesson series on this, and I may preach it one day. The first thing they build when they get back is the altar. The altar. That's the first thing they build. And they've got enemies on all sides. And the moral of the story is don't build the wall. See, if I'd have been in charge, I'd have been like, guys, we'll get the altar later. We got to get some walls up. I mean, we got enemies trying to kill us. They want us dead. Let's build some walls. But they got it right. They built the altar first. In other words, they're going to trust God with the enemies. Take care of the things of God first. It may not make a lick of sense, but it don't have to make sense. Trust God. He can take care of the enemies. Later on, they did build a wall, but they build the altar first. After they build the altar, they begin to build the second temple. And they don't complete it for many years. We'll get to that in just a few minutes. Uh, God's with them, so do not be afraid. Verse 6, for this is what the Lord of heaven's army says. 
in just a little while, like the heavens and the earth, the oceans and the dry land. Keep going. And I will shake all the nations. Now, I believe Haggai is looking prophetically beyond this temple they built. All right? The great difference between this temple, this second temple, and Solomon's temple and Moses' tabernacle. Moses' tabernacle had the glory of God come. Solomon's temple had the glory of God come. Now, God's glory left Solomon's temple too, but it did come. This temple here, this second temple, never was the glory of God. It never came until Jesus Christ walked into it. He was the glory of God in the temple. But he, he goes, Hannah goes by and said, I will shake the nations. I believe he's referring to the end times when we're going to go to the temple that's in heaven. We're going to see what Moses saw, and the treasures of all the nations will be brought to this temple. I will fill this place with glory, says the Lord of heaven's armies. The silver is mine, the gold is mine. Everybody say, God, God. has all the money. Never think God needs your money. If God ever asks for any money, don't think it's because he's on welfare. The silver is mine, the gold is mine, says the Lord of heaven's armies. Go ahead, verse 9. The future glory of this temple, this is the second temple now, the Lord says the future glory of this temple will be greater than its past glory. Now, looking at it, it was just kind of normal. Wasn't nothing great about it. But the Lord said, this temple right here is going to be greater than Solomon's temple ever was. And notice it says, the future glory of this temple will be greater than its past glory, says the Lord of heaven's army. And in this place, in this temple, I will bring peace. The prince of peace. He will walk in to this temple. And the Jews still missed it. I, the Lord of heaven's armies, have spoken. Is that the last verse? Okay, go to Ezra. We'll get there in a minute. Ezra 1 and 1. So since the temple that Solomon built in Jerusalem is the first temple, the temple that we speak of tonight is a rebuilt temple on that same site years later. Uh, 70 years later at least, probably more than that, uh, before it was finally completed. We know it was more than that. Uh, that we're talking about is the second temple that will be rebuilt by these uh, returned captives. In uh, 587 to 586 B.C., before Christ, the Babylonians invade Judah and completely destroy Jerusalem. Backing up a little bit, give you a little story here. And the Temple laid to waste. Many of the day's survivors are carried off into exile into Babylon. When you read about Daniel and the lion's den, that happens in Babylonian captivity. When you read about the three Hebrew children of fiery furnace, that happens in Babylonian captivity. I say Babylonian. Some of it's Medes and Persians because the Babylonians conquered all right? And then the Babylonians were the world power until many, many Tiko Eupharsin You've been waiting to balance, God said, and found wanting. And that night, the Medes and Persians came, and they took over, and they defeated the Babylonians. And so they became the world power. But everybody who was a subservient or a slave of the Babylonians, by default, became slaves of the Medes and Persians. I hope that makes sense. Try it, all right? So they go into Babylonian captivity, and you'll find Daniel is in Babylonian captivity. He's taken off into Babylonian captivity. And you'll find Ezekiel is also a prophet in Babylonian captivity that's carried away. So sometimes bad things happen because we live in a world that's full of bad sins. Uh, my brother said one time he, he was a nervous wreck going to get on an airplane to fly somewhere, going for some, I can't remember what he's going for. And somebody said, why are you nervous? God's with you. you and can't nothing, if it's not, that's what they said. If it's not your time to go, can't nothing happen? He said, well, I'm not worried about it. It's my time to go. The guy sitting next to me. I just want to know if it's his time to go. I'm being humorous, but we as Christians have to experience some very negative things in this world because this world is cursed by sin. 
God did not come to straighten this world up. He didn't come to make sure that our economy smooths out and that we get who we want and that we get all the money. He, he came to get us out of this world. And so they go into Babylonian captivity. These are righteous people who go into captivity, mind you. They have to suffer because of other people. Like Jeremiah, Old Testament prophets before them, like Jeremiah and Isaiah had promised the hope for future restoration beyond the judgment and the exile. And some of the survivors in Babylon cling to this hope, especially Daniel. You can read in his book. He'd been reading Jeremiah. He knew it's just 70 years worth. 539 B.C., a guy by the name of King Cyrus of Persia. Now, when I say Persia, the reason I say Persia is because the Babylonians were conquered by the Persians. I hope that I hope you can connect those dots. The Israelites are still subservient to the, the Persians now because when the Babylonians were defeated, everybody that was their servants became the Persian servants. So we got King Cyrus of Persia. He conquers the Babylonians and consolidates his power in the region. One year later, Cyrus issues a decree that allows the Israelites who have been exiled by the Babylonians to return home to Judah and to rebuild their city and their temple. He even returned some of the looted gold and silver bowls and dishes that the Babylonians had taken from the temple. So let's read a little bit of this. Ezra chapter 1 verse 1. Ezra is a great synopsis book on how this all happened if you want to kind of read about it. Ezra 1 and 1, in the first year of King Cyrus of Persia, the Lord fulfilled the prophecy he had given through Jeremiah. He stirred up the heart of Cyrus to put this proclamation in writing and to send it throughout his kingdom. Isn't it good that God still holds the hearts of rulers in his hands? There is a verse, I can't remember where it's at. God says the people get what they deserve. That's in the Bible. If we want to live wickedly, God will give us wicked leaders. This is what King Cyrus of Persia says, The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth. He has appointed me to build him a temple at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Now, King Cyrus says, God of heaven told me, send y'all back and build his temple in Jerusalem. Verse 3, any of you who are his people may go to Jerusalem and Judah to rebuild this temple of the Lord, the God of Israel, who lives in Jerusalem, and may your God be with you. Keep going, verse 4. Wherever this Jewish remnant is found, let their neighbors contribute toward their expenses by giving them silver and gold. This is kind of reminiscent, isn't it? This is kind of what happened the first time they came out of Egypt. They said, go to your neighbors and get some stuff. We got a temple to build supplies for the journey and livestock as well as voluntary offering for the temple of God in Jerusalem. Keep going. Verse 5, Then God stirred the hearts of the priests and the Levites and the leaders of the tribes of Judah and Benjamin. Now, there's only two tribes. I hope you understand that. There's only two tribes that went to Babylonian captivity. That's the tribe of Judah and Benjamin. The other ten tribes were split off. All right? They became a different nation. They're called the nation of Israel. And this two tribe nation is called the nation of Judah. That's what they're called for namesake, okay? Now, I'm going to go there. Just stay with me. Judah and Benjamin, to go to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple of the Lord. Keep going. <clears throat> Ezra 3 and 2, we'll get there in just a few minutes. All right? So led by Zerubbabel, this small group of Israelites do return to Jerusalem to try to rebuild the temple and the city. The temple is usually referred to, this temple is referred to as the second temple. Now you know why. The people first reconstruct the bronze altar that stood in the courtyard in front of the temple so that they can begin offering sacrifices again. Then they start on the temple itself and begin laying the temple foundation. We find this in Ezra chapter 3, verse 2. Then Jeshua, son of Je Je Jehozadak, joined his fellow priest and Zerubbabel, son of whoever that is, with his family, in rebuilding the altar of God of the God of Israel. They wanted to sacrifice burnt offerings on it as instructed in the law of Moses, the man of God. Keep going for me, Ezra 3.3. 3. Even though the people were afraid of the local residents, they rebuilt the altar 
at its old site. Then they began to sacrifice burnt offerings on the altar to the Lord each morning and evening. Keep going, verse 10. Verses here. When the builders completed the foundation of the Lord's temple, okay, they build the altar, it's done, and they begin to build the foundation. When they finally complete the foundation, now when you get a house foundation built, is the house built? Just foundation. But they celebrated when they got the foundation built. When the builders completed the foundation of the Lord's temple, the priests put on their robes and took their places to blow their trumpets, and the Levites, the sinners of Asap, clashed their cymbals to praise the Lord just as King David had prescribed. Verse 3, with praise and thanks, they sang this song to the Lord. He is good. He is, his faithful love for Israel endures forever. Then all the people gave a great shout, praising the Lord because the foundation of the Lord's temple had been laid. But many of the older priests, Levites, those who had been there and had seen Solomon's temple, Many of them and other leaders who had seen the first temple wept aloud when they saw the new temple foundation. The others, however, were shouting for joy. The joyful shouting and weeping mingled together in a loud noise that could be heard far, far in the distance. <clears throat> we'll go to Ezra 6 here in just a few moments. So because the older folks had seen the glory of Solomon's temple, they wept because this temple looked awful puny. But God said, don't weep. The glory in this temple will be greater than the glory in that temple. And the small group of returned exiles hardly has the resources that King Solomon did. And the newly reconstructed, reconstructed temple is scaled down tremendously in both size and appearance and beauty. The Bible says that the older folks, when they saw it, wept, and the younger folks shouted for joy. Now, a lot of our study tonight will have to go to a guy named Josephus. Josephus is a Jewish historian because we don't have much in our Bible to tell us much about this. But he's a Jewish historian writing in the late 1st century A.D., about 500 years later than some of these things, yet probably drawing from Jewish tradition. He knows a few things to tell us about this temple. And he states in his writings that the Persian kings had decreed that the rebuilt temple in Jerusalem must be 60 cubits smaller in size and in height. So by, you got to understand, when they built this temple, they were still slaves, even though they built another temple. Another neat thing, it's not in our lesson, but you can go to Ezra 3 and 7, you'll see they also use cedar in this temple. Some of the things of Solomon passed down to them again. Uh, Ezra 6, we'll go there in a minute. Ezra chapter 1 through ch chapter 6 explains the rebuilding project uh, quickly faces opposition from neighboring rulers. Now, you'll find the pattern of their neighbor rulers. The first thing they tried to do, now they've got a, they've got a decree from the king of Persia that says you can go back and rebuild your temple. And so the neighbors say, well, let, let us help you. And they said, no, you can't help us. Only we can do this. And then they begin to fight against them. And then they got the king of Persia against them. They had a whole bunch of, of resistance. Anytime you're going to do the things of God, you're probably going to meet some resistance. Somebody said, I'm trying to live for God. I don't know why it's so hard. I know why it's so hard. You're trying to live for God. The rebuilding project quickly faces opposition from neighboring rulers. As Haggai indicates, the people in Jerusalem start to lose interest in the difficult task of rebuilding the temple and instead begin to shift their focus to rebuilding their own houses and their own personal well-being. Nothing wrong with building your own house, except God wants you to take care of His stuff first. You may not appreciate that, but God doesn't have to bargain with us. Seek ye first the kingdom of God? He actually meant that. Thus construction halts completely in about 536 B.C. And here they live with an unfinished temple as it sits unoccupied, maybe overrun with weeds for about 16 years. The temple comes to a complete halt. They have an altar. They have a foundation. 
but they don't have a completed temple. Until God sends them a prophet named Haggai, he steps in and he rebukes the people for not completing the temple and then exhorts them to finish the rebuilding project. Haggai successfully motivates the people to return to temple construction project and they do finish the second temple. We find it described here in Ezra chapter 6 verse 14. So the Jewish elders continued their work and they were greatly encouraged by the preaching of the prophet Haggai and Zechariah son of Ido. The temple was finally finished as had been commanded by the God of Israel and decreed by Cyrus, Darius, and Artaxerus, kings of Persia. Next slide. The temple was completed on March 12th during the sixth year of King Darius' reign. Is there another slide? Okay, stop right there, Nehemiah's wall. So they finally do complete this temple project, but it takes them many, many years. Why? Because they stopped. They should have never stopped building the temple. So God in His mercy sends them a preacher and says, get back to my business. <clears throat> in Haggai 2, we find the second temple is nowhere nearly as impressive as the awe-inspiring structure that I mentioned Solomon built. God, however, does not seem to be worried about the lack of beauty of this temple. He reminds them of a more important fact, and that is his spirit is still dwelling with them. God also tells them that the glory of this present house, this second temple, will be greater than the glory of the former house, which was Solomon's temple. And that all points to Jesus Christ. It's fulfilled when the glory of God walks into this second temple in our Bible. Amen? Amen? The story of the construction of the second temple is described in only but a few verses in our Bible and contains very few details. And so we're going to have to step over to some historians to help us out with some details on this second temple. Both Ezra and Haggai that we've read from tonight, the text repeatedly stresses that those Israelites who returned after the exile do not have their own king. That's imperative and important. Though they do return, they are still slaves, but are still firmly under Persian rule. The central plot in the Ezra account is whether or not the Persian king who rules over them will continue to allow them to rebuild this temple. In Ezra's account of the completion of the temple, Darius, the Persian king, is mentioned three times. Over and again, the Bible repeats, they're still under bondage. The most significant difference, however, of all of these is that there is never one mention of the glory of God coming to reside in the second temple. Because the glory of God is the demonstration of God. And when you find God demonstrating, that's how you know God is in a place. We find Him on Mount Sinai. We find Him in the tabernacle. We find Him in the first temple. But we never find Him mentioned in the second temple. And again, until Jesus comes in. But you know what I'm talking about. There's never a pillar of fire or a pillar of cloud that comes down on this temple. The point of the tabernacle and the temple is to provide a residence for God. He dwells in their midst in a very literal sense, yet that simply does not happen in the second temple. God still promises His presence, but He shifts His focusing on the presence of His Spirit among them rather than His actual residence in the holy place of the temple. He promises that His glory will come and fill this temple in the future. And He leaves the time for this event unspecified for them to look for. Now God has this pattern with the people. He wanted to be their king, remember? But they wanted a king like all the other nations. God was their invisible king. The Bible says in New, T in New Testament, unto the king eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God. God wanted to be their invisible king, but they said, we want to have a king like everybody else. And that got them in trouble. Don't ever be guilty of wanting to be like everybody else. And so God this time leaves them somewhat in an act of faith. He said, I'm with you, but you're not going to see my demonstration. You're going to have to walk by faith. Second temple also is with ever a mention of the Ark 
of the covenant. Some historians think that maybe they built another one and placed in there a replica, and some think it just wasn't there. And you're going to find as we go along, it probably wasn't even there. The Ark of the Covenant had been stolen by the Babylonians and probably melted down for whatever golden purposes they wanted to use it for. Because when the Babylonians stole the Ark of the Covenant, God was already gone. The fact that the presence of God does not take up residence in this second temple is important. Because you'll see when, when the Romans come in and they ransack this temple in a few years, their warrior comes in and he just tears the place apart. And that, God had been there, God had struck him dead. The return to exiles reconstruct this scale down economy version of the temple but God directs them toward the future in regard to the coming of his glory in this temple this expectation will be fulfilled in the advent of Jesus Christ strangely they missed it because they got caught up of the temple but he himself arrives back in Jerusalem, well after it is completed. The second temple is rebuilt in about 520 B.C. Ezra, and the wave of returning exiles associated with him, as there's several waves of exiles that keep coming back to Jerusalem. They arrive around 458 B.C. Ezra will be instrumental in the difficult task. Here's the difficult task. You ready? Of reconstructing or constituting the religious life of these returned exiles. Because it's one thing to have a church. It's another thing to be a believer. we got to get back to the things of God. And so he's instrumental in that. Nehemiah, on the other hand, this is Nehemiah's wall. This is an actual replica that they believe Nehemiah's wall looked like. Now, if you go look at Jerusalem today, it's a lot bigger than this. This is what they were able to do. I think it was 59 days it took them to build that. Every man built the wall in front of his house. <clears throat> and so Nehemiah is used as he comes back later and he, he begins to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. And it's important that we have walls in our life. It's important that the pastor don't build all the walls in your life. You need to build your own walls. I want, I want the pastor to tell me what to do. You need to get with God and you need to get some walls built. But I will build walls for the church. Are important. But walls are always secondary to the altar. The eastern wall and, and most of the northern wall in this picture that they rebuild serve uh, to, to furnish a wall for the temple mount, where the temple mount is today. And Nehemiah, Nehemiah points out that the priestly families built this portion of the wall. These priests made repairs each in front of his own house, Nehemiah says. Thus, at this time, those priests who had returned to Jerusalem had taken up residence on the Temple Mount near the temple, if not in the temple. Chronologically, the Old Testament ends with the ministry of Ezra and Nehemiah. We do not have any biblical information about Jerusalem or this second temple until the New Testament era begins. Over a 400 years period that And so we have to kind of go outside the Bible somewhat to get some more references. The, the apocryphal books of First and Second Maccabees gives us some information. Say, Pastor, you believe in First and Second Maccabees? I believe it can be historically right. I believe American history can be, his, can be historically right. That doesn't make it the Word of God. So uh, there's, I hope you get the difference. I don't think we should take the book of Maccabees and put it in the Bible. But I think we can learn from historical books about what went on during these time periods, if that makes sense. So in the book of First and Second Maccabees, 
and the first century uh, Jewish historian Josephus provides us with a wealth of information of this intertestamental period that went on that we should as Christians probably learn about and know about. The Persians controlled Palestine and Judea. Now the Persians took over the Babylonians. I hope you're with me. They controlled Palestine and Judea until this guy named Alexander the Great. Anybody ever heard of Alexander the Great? Y'all didn't know y'all was coming for history class, did you? Until Alexander the Great conquers the entire region. He, he's the next world kingdom. Babylonians, Medes and Persians, Greeks, the Romans. And the Antichrist is going to rule over a, a mixture of the Romans and the clay. It's going to be called a, a revived Holy Roman Empire. Most people like to term it like that. It's got something to do with Rome because it's got the same element in the statue in Daniel. And so... Jerusalem and Antiochus the third continues that policy but in 175 BC go to my next slide Antiochus the fourth in 175 BC a guy named Antiochus that's how I say his word his name the fourth comes to power he's from the Seleucid dynasty he calls himself and you've probably heard this Antiochus Epiphanes some of y'all heard of that. He names himself Antichus Epiphanes. Epiphanes means the manifest God. Our God manifested. He decides to turn Jerusalem into a Hellenistic or a Greek city that would speak Greek and worship Greek gods. He outlaws Judaism and all forms of Jewish worship, especially in the temple, this second temple. In 167 B.C., Antichus Epiphanes loots the temple, erects the statue of himself, in the temple courtyard and converts and converts the temple itself into a temple of Zeus and places an altar to the god Zeus in the temple and sacrifices a pig on this altar, thus desecrating the temple. You can see the temple here. This will be the second temple. You can see a, he builds a statue of himself somewhere in the courtyard and he offers a pig on the altar. This is kind of neat because it's almost, it's kind of, I got to look at this, study it out. If you look at it, it's, it's kind of weird, the similarities. Because before Jesus Christ came the first time, there was an anti-Christ figure, Antichus Epiphanes, who sacrificed a desecrating thing on the altar. Kind of like the abomination of desolation. And then God in the flesh showed up. It's going to happen again. The Antichrist is going to desecrate the temple. And then God himself is going to show up. Somebody may have got that. I thought it was pretty neat. But Antichus Epiphanes, he desecrates this second temple. We don't know this from the Bible. We have to go to history to find these things out. This action enrages much of the Jewish population. A man named Matthias and his five sons from a priestly fam family later known as the Hasmonians is how I say their name, organize and lead a revolt against Atticus Epiphanes, 
Judas, one of Matthias' sons, plays a central role in the revolt and picks up the nickname of Maccabeus. Anybody ever heard of Maccabees? Maccabeus means the hammer. And thus, this family is also becomes known as the Maccabees. And so we have these historical books called the Book of Maccabees. And it's about how these, these Jewish boys, this family, priestly family, rises up and they revolt against Antichus, Antichus Epiphanes because he desecrates the temple. They go to war with him and they win. Are y'all with me? Somebody said, I'm not, I think. I don't blame you if you're not with me. It's a lot. I'm, I'm trying my best here. Organize. Somebody said, keep on. I better keep on. You, you lost me, Pastor. Just keep going. Don't back up now. Uh, you can go home and watch it on, on, on Facebook. I mean, on, on YouTube. So here comes these, these Maccabees, and they go to war with Antichus, Antichus Epiphanes. And in 164 B.C., they defeat the Seleucid army. Now, the Seleucids was that one of those four dynasties that came after Alexander the Great. They defeat that Seleucid army, recapture Jerusalem, and cleanse the temple. To celebrate the cleansing of this temple, this second temple, we have the Jewish fest festival today called Hanukkah. Hanukkah is instituted. Because they defeated their adversaries, and for a little period of time, they get to rule Jerusalem by themselves. But the Hasmoneans, this, this family, also establish a priest-king monarchy. That's kind of neat, too, because in the, in the book of Revelations, the Antichrist is going to come, he's going to have a priestly side, and he's going to have a kingly side. But the Hasmoneans put them both together. They, they, they established a priest-king monarchy, and what I mean by that is whoever's on top is both king and priest. Well, that causes problems because you're dealing with flesh. Everybody wants to be on top. And for roughly the next 100 years, Jerusalem, Judea, is an independent place and ruled by Jewish, or really the Hasmonean dynasty, Jews, a Jewish king who also serves as high priest. That was wrong. Probably shouldn't have happened. God should institute the high priest and the king, actually, but that's where we're at. We have strong, strong archaeological evidence indicating that the Hasmoneans ex extend the Temple Mount even bigger. Some say by about 89 feet to the south, they, they grow that Temple Mount during their time. In 67 BC, a civil war breaks out between two Hasmonean princes. One's name is Hyrcanus, is how I say it. And the other is Artibus, is how I say it. And that, that's the best I can do for you. Hyrus and Articus. That's how you're going to know them tonight anyway. Hi, we'll just say hi and a. Got, they fighting each other. Hi and a. And now, why are they fighting? Because both of them want to be the next priest and king. And at this point in time in history, the Romans are now the world power. Remember when Jesus walked this earth, there was a second temple in existence. But the Romans ruled over Jerusalem. Not the Persians, not the Babylonians, the Romans. This is how we got there. The Romans have become the dominant power of the region. Both Hyrcanus and Ar Aristobus appeal to the Romans for help. Both of them want the, the Romans to come in and help defeat their enemy and make them the priest king. In 69 B.C., the Roman general Pompey enters Jerusalem with his army. He picks sides with Hyrcanius II and besieges the temple. Why does he besiege the temple? Because that's where Aristobus and his troops are fortified. And they lay siege to the second temple for about three months, and the Romans finally breach the temple wall and slaughter all of the defenders inside the temple. Josephus tells us these things and states that the number of slain by Pompey, the Roman general, in the temple was about 12,000. Pompey himself enters into the second temple and even the most holy place, but he does not plunder the temple. Now, you've got to understand, Pompey would not be allowed into the most holy place if the glory of God resided there. Kind of gives us some understanding that 
God really hasn't moved back in there. He's with the people, but he's not with them like he was in Solomon's temple. I hope you understand that. Josephus recounts that Pompey saw the golden lampstand. Josephus tells us that Pompey saw the golden table. He saw many of the golden utensils that were in the holy place, but these, the Ark of the Covenant, which gives us a strong reason to believe there is no Ark of the Covenant. They lost it to the Babylonians, and they don't have it back. All right, y'all with me? God himself does not come and fill this temple with his glory and as he did in the tabernacle and in Solomon's temple. Thus, the Roman general Pompey can enter into the most holy place without being killed by God. Listen, God would kill a high priest that was allowed in if he came in in the wrong manner. So there ain't no way no, no evil Pompey can walk in and God not take care of business. With the arrival of Pompey and the Roman army, Jerusalem and Judea are brought under Roman administrative control. And so now we're under the Roman control. Neat thing about Jesus, this is not in the lesson, but neat thing about Jesus, if you look at Jesus' 12 disciples, you will find in his 12 disciples, he has a guy who's sympathetic for the Romans, and he has a tax collector. Two guys that ought to be killing each other. But when you come to Jesus, you get to lay that junk down. There's a few years, I can't remember where it was. I saw it maybe in a video or something. This one guy who was a, a former KKK guy, another guy who was a former Black Panther. They were holding hands and jumping up and down, worshiping the Lord together. When you come to Jesus, you get to put all that mess down. Or in Christ Jesus, we're all one. Woo! Antichrist. Go to my next slide for me. Synagogues. We'll get there in just a few minutes. I hope, I hope I'm giving you a little bit of understanding about this second temple and how we get to where we are. That's what I'm trying to do. And I don't have a whole lot of Bible for this lesson, so I'm trying to give you what I have. And so the Romans now take over. And Pompey goes in. There's no Ark of the Covenant. He's not killed with the arrival of Pompey and the Roman army, Jerusalem, Judea, are brought under Roman administrative control. But the, re the region remains unstable for the next 30 years. And it's pretty unstable when Jesus gets here. <clears throat> but there is a Adulaman, nobleman. And Adul Adulamia was a city just south of Judea. But it is not Jewish. Remember that. There's a guy named Antipar. And he has a son named Herod. And he serves in various administrative capacities to help the Romans secure the area of Jerusalem. Thus, in about 40 B.C., the Roman Senate appoints Herod as king over Judea. The Romans appoint him. He's not a Jew. And after three year, after about a three-year struggle, including another siege of Jerusalem and and due largely to the strong support of the Roman general Mark Anthony, Herod consolidates power and begins to reign firmly in Jerusalem as king. He is not even ethnically a Jew because he has an Adulaman father and a Nabatian mother, not a Jew at all. He does marry a Hesmion princess and thus strengthens his claim to the throne. To distinguish, to distinguish this Herod from other Herods you'll see in your Bible, remember, he's always called Herod the Great. We find him at the birth of Jesus. Remember, he's trying to slaughter all the babies. At the time of Jesus, we find synagogues. Everybody say synagogues. I'm almost done with my lesson for tonight, so thank you for, thank you for staying and getting some of this information. I know this is not hoop and hollering, but it's just, Good, good teaching on how we got to where we are. I'll try my best to get you dancing and shouting Sunday, maybe. At the time of Jesus, we find this thing called synagogues. Kind of like local churches on every corner. This was a strange phenomenon. This happens after exile. 
after they lost their first and second temple, they began these things called synagogues. Synagogue is actually a, a house of prayer. The ruins of several synagogues in Israel can be dated back to the first century A.D. And over the next several hundred years, numerous well-built synagogues apparently appeared all across the Greco-Roman world. If you, if you read the writings of Paul in the epistles, you will find it was his custom to go to the synagogue in whatever city he went to. There were synagogues not just in Israel, not just in Jerusalem, but all over the Greco-Roman world. They built synagogues everywhere. Everywhere Jews went, they built synagogues. It was a contact point for them to come together and read Scripture and look at the Word of God. You see, they really did need this because they had a habit of forgetting God. So they needed to come back every week and remind themselves. And so do we. Because when you think you ain't going to fall, you're probably already falling. So they build these synagogues all across the world where these scattered Jews, Jewish communities now live. And the, the scattering of the Jews is called the dysphoria. And Paul in his, in his journeys found them everywhere. That's how he won, folks. Uh, you'll, you'll find no mention of synagogues in the Old Testament at all. You won't find synagogues until you get to the New Testament. Between the time of the exile and the opening of the New Testament era, the Jewish faith undergoes a significant transformation or paradigm shift where the synagogue and the Sabbath day play more and more of a central role in Jewish life than they ever have in the past. There became a time and a place where they would get together and study the Scriptures. Judaism is what came out of this. And what Jesus often dealt with was those who were Judaizers, who were hard on these things. The term given to the evolved Jewish religion that incorporates regular synagogue worship. It is understandable how the synagogue phenomenon developed during the dysphoria. They're, they're dispersing after the exile. With the temple in ruins and with no festivals or sacrifices taking place, the scattered Jews redirected their worship to the Torah, the first five books of the Bible. And they added Sabbath gatherings to their regular worship. The Old Testament center centered strictly on worship, very tightly to the temple and the temple only. That was God's great problem. When the two nations divided, this is extra, I shouldn't probably... Try you say if you stay with me. When the two nations divided, ten tribes and two tribes, you will find the ten tribes went over here and they built their own temple. When Jesus met the woman at the well, he said, "You're not worshiping in the right temple. You're over there on Mount Gerizim. The real temple's in Jerusalem." Oh, that's a whole, I shouldn't even go there. That's a whole other lesson. I'm sorry. Forget that and get back with me. Try to. So they, they, they begin all these, these transformations, and there's, there's these little churches everywhere now. That's what I call synagogues. But the Jewish temple in runs, there's no festivals, and they add these things to their... The Old Testament enters centered worship on the temple, including sacrifices and festivals that all, all the males were required to attend three times a year. The rise of the synagogues shifted the focus somewhat away from pilgrimage down to Jerusalem or big national festivals to weekly local gatherings. What is curious is that at the time of Jesus Christ, when he walks this earth in the flesh, synagogues were apparently very common all across Judea and Galilee. Here's the thing. Even though there is a large functioning temple in Jerusalem. So they had synagogues while they had the second temple. Because the second temple never was quite what Solomon's temple was. But God was changing the whole structure of things. Because now we are the temple of the Holy Ghost. There was one time he said, I was with you. He said, but now I'm going to be in you. The whole paradigm begins to shift. In the New Testament, we see Jesus regularly engaging Jewish leaders, both in the temple and in the synagogues. Y'all with me? 
Luke chapter 4, verse 14, And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit. This is after He goes 40 days and 40 nights into the wilderness, and He comes out of the wilderness in the power of the Spirit into Galilee, and there went out fame of Him throughout all the region round about, verse 15, and He taught in their synagogues, being glorified of all. And He came to Nazareth, this is hometown, where He had been brought up. And as his custom was, this was his custom, this is what he did. He went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. Verse 17, And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place wherein it is written, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, and to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book of Isaiah and gave it again to the minister. So there was a minister there. And sat down. The eyes of all of them that were in the synagogue were fastened upon him. And he began to say unto them, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. Jesus began his earthly ministry in a synagogue, not in the temple. He goes into the temple. But I, I, the very first lesson we covered on this on this series, he goes into the temple, and when he walks out of the temple, he said, "There won't be a stone upon a stone. This whole thing is going to be wiped out." He wasn't going back to that. He's going to take us to a new heaven and a new earth with the new temple. The synagogue had little to do with sacrifices or even priests. It was a place of prayer and of reading and teaching the Torah, led by non-priestly rabbis. It served as religious schools for the community, and other community affairs went on there. It was kind of like the, the community center for the community, but it was religious in its focus. And so also, we ought to have that in our life. <clears throat> I'm going to stop there. That's enough. We'll get into more of the design of the second temple and Josephus and the things he had to show us with this second temple. It's pretty, pretty awesome stuff he's going to show us in this second temple. It becomes known as, you may have heard this, Herod's temple. We call it Herod's temple because when Herod comes along, this is this is next lesson. When Herod comes along, he does not add to the second temple. He demolishes the second temple and builds a beautiful temple that is built by his design. So literally, the second temple was laid flat. Herod's temple was actually the third temple. I know we're not supposed to say that, but that's what happened. So now you know what you're not supposed to know. We're looking for the fourth temple. Let's stand. <clears throat>